next item, <coughs> excuse me, the next item of business is a debate on motion 2504, in the name of Alec Rowley and supporting local communities. Can I invite members, <coughs> do forgive me, invite members who wish to speak in the debate to press their request to speak buttons now. And I call on Mr Rowley to speak to and move the motion. 13 minutes, please, Mr Rowley. Yeah, thank you, President Officer. In bringing forward this motion today, I hope that we can build a consensus in this Parliament, not only that fuel poverty in Scotland in the 21st century is unacceptable, but that we will take the steps needed for its eradication. Labour, like other parties, highlighted fuel poverty in our manifesto back in May, and we committed to a warm homes bill, as did the SNP. In June this year, the House Minister, Kevin Stewart, told this Parliament, and I quote, we will introduce a warm homes bill. I know there is a cross-party support for that, and we will ensure it happens. I very much welcomed that statement and was therefore disappointed when the programme for government brought forward by SNP ministers in September of this year made no mention of such a bill. Disappointed given the scale and impact of fuel poverty across all measures of social well-being. So given that the bill has not materialised, Scottish Labour want to restate our view and get agreement from the government for a Warm Homes Act for Scotland that can tackle fuel poverty, improve energy efficiency and help meet our climate change targets. Our main ask of government today is to reset the fuel poverty target. We believe also highlighted the challenges facing the public and social and private rented markets is important and call for parity across all sectors when it comes to the energy efficient requirements, efficiency requirements. The 2016 target to eradicate fuel poverty has not been met and this is a source of regret. Whilst I'm sure others will say more on missing the target and that Jackie Bailey, the minister who brought forward this target, will be very disappointed, there has nonetheless been real progress as a direct result of her introducing such legislation. I do believe that there has been an underinvestment on what was needed. The evidence supports this, but nonetheless, progress can be celebrated. In particular, the success of local councils and housing associations must be recognised and built upon. And what is clear is that by placing a duty on public housing bodies through housing quality and energy efficiency standards, there has been major progress that is tackling fuel poverty in the social rented sector. We have also seen programmes and there, we've all seen programmes in our own areas that have included windows, doors, cladding, insulation, boiler replacement and heating systems being put in place. And as I know, and as we, we also know, councils and third sector organisations have been active in providing information services to householders to promote the benefit take-up campaigns and to offer energy saving advice to keep fuel bills as low as possible. Indeed, I am told that on a scale of 0 to 10 for energy efficiency, the social rented sector was averaging 3 when the duty for the energy efficiency standard was introduced, and today it stands at around 7.5. Now, that is progress, and it is that progress that has improved health, health and well-being and boosted the weekly budget of families across Scotland. But it begs the question, why, if it is right for the public rented sector mar market, would it not be right for the private rented sector market? So much of what is, what is actually publicly funded through housing benefit in the private rented market. And indeed, what can be done to encourage improvement to owner-occupied homes so that standards improve across our houses right across the nation? The most recent House Conditions Survey noted that people in the private rented sector were more likely to cite a problem with their home as a reason for not keeping warm in winter, such as poor insulation, drafts or inadequate heating, whilst in the social renters they were more likely to say it was the cost. 
This highlights how house and tenure differs and is why we say fuel efficiency for the private rented sector must be addressed. Over the last 10 years, the number of people living in the private rented sector has doubled to 368,000. An estimated 80,000 families with children live in the private rented sector. As, an exist as the Existence Home Alliance has pointed out, the Scottish Government Poverty Advisor Naomi Eisenstadt said in her report that housing costs push many people into poverty and the focus needs to be on core costs like rent, local property related taxes and home energy costs. So as well as calling today for a reset of the target for fuel poverty, we are calling on the government to introduce energy efficiency standards for the private rented housing sector in Scotland. So no matter the landlord, social, private or public, the energy efficiency standard would be the same. It cannot be right that on a scale of 0 to 10, energy efficiency on average in a council house or a housing association house is 7.5, whilst in the private sector, in the private sector let, it is 2 or 3. This is just not acceptable. And let us not forget, the average private rent is 86% higher than the average social rent. And over the last 10 years, an estimated 140,000 private rented sector households were living in relative poverty. And I hope the government will agree that we need to clarify not on whether, but on when this is going to happen. What we are calling for is straightforward. We think that tenants in the private housing sector should have the same rights and support for a warm and safe home as tenants in the public and social sector. And as I said earlier, with these powers, it will assist in meeting the target that we hopefully can all sign up to resetting. Can I also make the point the government has announced its intention to bring forward a child poverty bill and there will be a specific target for tackling child poverty. I agree with that, and I say to the government that it is the same reasoning, the same principles for having a child poverty target that should apply to the argument for resetting a fuel poverty target. Energy Action Scotland has set out clear recommendations on fuel poverty, and they make clear a target that is realistic but ambitious must be set. It must be accompanied by a fuel poverty strategy and action plan with costs and timelines. It is essential that there is not a hiatus following the passing of the 2016 target date. Norman Kerr, the Director of Energy Action Scotland, has called on the government to widen the discussion to include key stakeholders and for there to be a public consultation in order to reset the target as soon as is possible. He states, and I quote, the problem of cold, damp and expensive to heat homes must be addressed and there should be no fuel poverty in Scotland. I agree. But can we also be clear today that the government must look at, in addition, the cost of energy? Unison Scotland this week issued a brief and said, fuel poverty is a scandal. There was once upon a time a commitment to eradicate fuel poverty. But while that may seem like a fairy tale dream, thousands across Scotland live with the grim day-to-day -day nightmare of making the choice between food and fuel. At the same time, we have private companies making millions of profits. This needs to change. We need much more provision of energy as a social good rather than a source of enrichment. And should we be looking to change our broken energy system? The Scottish Fuel Poverty Strategic Working Group have identified energy costs as one of the four, as, or as another of the four drivers for fuel poverty. So we would say that we must examine what options are available for more public control of energy provision. 
WWF Scotland, Friends of the Earth Scotland, the RSPB Scotland, all say that Scotland will have to deliver 40% of its heat from renewable sources by 2030, in addition to energy improvements, in order to fulfil the target under the Climate Change Scotland Act. To achieve this, we should be planning a massive expansion of district and communal heating systems and should be working with local government to explore all options for municipal and community energy schemes building on the good work that happens in local councils right across Scotland. It is not acceptable that prices are rising faster than household incomes. And unless we address this, we cannot begin to eradicate fuel poverty. Scottish fuel bills are up 138% since 2003. More help must be given to people who are fuel poor to switch to better tariffs, ensuring their billing is correct and enabling some form of debt relief. There is also the option to use the new social security powers to explore the potential solutions to support people on low incomes to afford sufficient energy for heating for healthy living. All of this work needs to happen. One of the recommendations from the Strategic Working Group is that the government should identify specific measures to support customers in rural off-gas grid areas who suffer from higher energy costs than in the rest of Scotland. This also needs to happen. So, presiding officer, whilst there will be deep disappointment at the failure to eradicate fuel poverty and meet the target, we need to reset that target, but there must be a little satisfaction at the progress that has been made in some parts of our society, namely on, for the housing associations and the councils and the public rented sector. At the end of the day, no doubt today, we will hear much about statistics around fuel poverty and poor housing. But I would come back to um, something that I've mentioned in this parliament before, which was earlier this year when I was in Paisley campaigning and I met a family who told me that they had moved out of their cold, damp house that they were in and moved into a new housing association house. And there was two key points that they made to me. Firstly, that in the old cold, damp house, 25% of their household income was going on energy costs. When they moved into the new house with the proper energy in place, it, it was down to below 5% of their income. Secondly, the little girl had asthma problems, and in the cold, damp house, they were continually having to make emergency visits to hospitals because of the dampness. Once they moved into their new home, the little girl had not once, not once, had to go back to hospital. So the benefits of actually tackling fuel poverty are there for everyone to see. As Shelter Scotland has said recently, Every one pound spent on reducing fuel poverty in Scotland, the NHS alone will save 42 pence. There is overwhelming reasons for tackling fuel poverty. Let's unite together in this parliament. Let's agree to reset the target and get on with the challenge at hand. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Rowley. I don't know if you moved the motion, did you? Did you move the motion? Thank you very much. I just like it for completeness. I now call Minister Kevin Stewart to speak to and move Amendment 2504.3. Eight minutes, please. Uh, thank you, President Officer, and I'll start by moving the amendment so I don't forget. Um, I welcome today's debate on fuel poverty. Um, this government is committed to doing all it can to create a fairer, more equal Scotland, and ensuring people no longer live in fuel poverty is central to that. I'm sure that the Chamber will support the message in today's motion that we must ensure everyone lives in an affordable, warm home. Addressing fuel poverty requires a collaborative effort across political parties, across government departments, alongside other bodies such as the UK government, Ofgem, energy suppliers, local government and the third sector. As a result of this government's efforts, we've seen some great achievements. Uh, over a million Scottish households have received energy efficiency measures from a range of programmes. 
uh, and the energy efficiency of our homes has massively improved. Two out of five homes are now in the top three ratings for energy efficiency, an increase of 71% since 2010 and 11% in the last year alone. We now have proportionately 35% more homes with the top three EPC ratings, that's A to C, uh, than there are south of the border. We've put in place a range of schemes to support those who may have difficulty heating their homes. And as promised in our manifesto, we will bring forward plans for warm homes legislation in 2017. We've already allocated over £650 million since 2009. And as we set out in our programme for government, we will make available a further half a billion pounds over the next four years to tackle fuel poverty, improve energy efficiency, and further distribute low carbon heat. That means by the end of 2021, we will have committed over £1 billion to making our homes and buildings warmer and cheaper to heat. And we are boosting the budget when we can. We announced a further £10 million for domestic energy efficiency this year, bringing our budget to £113 million, which we will use to help reduce the costs of energy bills for householders. Unfortunately, last year, the UK government, without warning, ended the Green Deal Home Improvement Fund a year early, depriving Scottish households of £15 million. We recognise that eradicating fuel poverty requires more than investment in energy efficiency. Above inflation price increases by energy companies beyond the Scottish Government's control have greatly impacted on Scottish households. Indeed, if energy prices had risen in line with inflation, fuel poverty levels in 2014 would have been 9.5% instead of 35%. And behind that, of course, as Mr Rowley pointed out, are people. Combined with the interim recommendations of the Fuel Poverty Strategic Working Group, um, I advise Parliament that our statutory target uh, to eradicate fuel poverty by the end of November this year wasn't going to be met. As Parliament will know, both the Strategic Working Group and the Scottish Rural Fuel Poverty Task Force published their reports at the end of October with over 100 recommendations between them. The expert advice from the Fuel Poverty Strategic Working Group is that the fuel poverty definition is crucial to the basis of any new statutory target and that the current definition should be reviewed because it may be unhelpful in ensuring support is delivered to those who need it most. Uh, well, indeed. Ms. Whaley. Will the Minister give a firm commitment that he will reset the target date by which we intend to end fuel poverty, and when will he bring this forward to Parliament? Minister. Let, let, me, let me start by saying um, that I immediately accepted the recommendation uh, to review the definition of fuel poverty uh, and will commission uh, the expert independent review that the report calls for. Uh, let me be clear, this does not mean that I want to define fuel poverty away. Uh, far from it. Uh, not, not at the moment. Let me finish and I'll answer your question. Any changes which come out of this review must be justified to ensure that those in need receive the most support. And based on this advice, we believe it is important that we first commission the independent review of the definition, which we expect to be completed in summer 2017. And based on the outcome of that, we will consult on the new fuel poverty strategy, including a new fuel poverty target. I will do. John Scott. Thank you for taking the intervention, Minister. Would the Minister, notwithstanding what he's just said, accept that whatever targets he sets himself or however he describes it, he's made that task so much harder for himself by reducing the budget between 2015, 16, 16, 17 from 119 million to 103 million? Kevin Stewart. Uh, Mr Scott had been listening to what I said earlier. Um, the budget reduction that took place was a budget reduction from the Westminster government. £15 million that could have been spent here in Scotland was ripped out of our budget by a Westminster government. I hope that Mr Scott uh, will speak to his colleagues, uh, President Officer, uh, in London and ask them if they will restore 
uh, that £15 million so that we can use that uh, to help families in fuel poverty across Scotland. We recognise, not at the moment, we recognise the scale of the challenge to effectively tackle fuel poverty. The two expert groups were tasked with providing insights to help us take this first step in the development of our new fuel, fuel poverty strategy. And their recommendations will inform our thinking on developing an approach to tackling fuel poverty and improving the energy efficiency of people's homes wherever they live in Scotland. Our strategy will work alongside the actions we have set out in our Fairer Scotland Action Plan to alleviate poverty and to tackle inequality. We will take our strategy forward through Scotland's Energy Efficiency Programme, or SEEP for short, and the related energy strategy which we will consult on early next year, alongside plans to consult on minimum energy efficiency standards for homes in the private rented sector and regulation for district heating, uh, both things which Mr Riley mentioned in his speech. Work to develop SEEP is underway and just over a month ago we allocated over £9 million for pilot projects this year. We will continue to engage with partners across all relevant sectors to transform the energy efficiency of existing buildings across Scotland to help reduce energy costs and to tackle fuel poverty. I will do. You are in your last minute, Minister, but you can if you wish. I'll be very quick. I'm sure the Minister would, would, would share my view that we need clarity. Um, I asked him would he reset the target to end fuel poverty. He talked about a new fuel poverty target that could be entirely different. Which is it? What I've said quite clearly is we will we'll review the definition of fuel poverty through the independent report and based on the outcome of that we will consult on a new fuel poverty strategy including a new fuel poverty target. I don't think I can be any clearer than that. In conclusion, presiding officer, I'd like to invite everyone in this chamber uh, to work with this government to develop a new fuel po poverty strategy uh, for Scotland. This needs to take into account the review of the fuel po poverty definition. As part of that process, we will give careful consideration to any constructive suggestions put forward by others. In the meantime, we will continue to do what we have been doing very well for the past few years, helping Scottish householders live in warmer, more affordable homes. I am absolutely determined to do everything we can as a government to tackle fuel poverty and I look forward to working with all colleagues in this chamber, um, stakeholders including local government and the third sector, uh, as we all uh, need combined efforts uh, to achieve this. Thank you, President Officer. I call Adam Tompkins to speak to and move Amendment 2. 504.1. No Thank more than seven minutes, please, Mr. Thank you, Chair. Deputy Presiding Officer. I have to say, uh, in opening, it's incredibly disappointing to hear a government trying to hit the brake when all of the opposition parties in this, in this chamber this afternoon are trying to encourage the government to hit the accelerator, when the government tries to amend a Labour motion to take out the hard-edged requirement for action with the SNP's preference for inaction. I welcome this debate on fuel poverty, and I congratulate... No, I will not, Mr. Minister. Um, I welcome this debate on fuel poverty and I congratulate the Labour Party for making their time available this afternoon so that we can discuss it. It's been pointed out before that in the Scottish Government's ministerial portfolios, communities and social security sit together, but it speaks volumes, Deputy Presiding Officer, that it is in opposition time and not in government time that we have a debate designed to underscore the essential link between localism and effective anti-poverty strategies. The Scottish Government may believe in a centralised, top-down, one-size-fits-all, nanny-knows-best approach to poverty, but all four opposition parties in this chamber, from their different political perspectives, can see just how wrong ministers are about this. We will be supporting the Labour motion this evening. Its opening words are that the Parliament welcomes the recently published report of the Scottish Fuel Poverty Strategy Working Group. And that report correctly identifies that fuel poverty has a number of causes, some within government's control and others harder to reach. Fuel poverty... John Mason. Uh, I thank the member for giving way. Would you accept that one of the reasons is income and that uh, sanctions imposed by the Conservative government uh, is putting people into fuel poverty? 
Adam Tomkins. Um, I, I think it's interesting that the report notes that 58% of the fuel poor are not classified as income poor. One of the lessons that we learn from a careful reading of the report is that thinking about poverty only through the prism of income, income of course is important, but thinking about poverty only through the prism of income will lead to ineffective anti-poverty strategies and not effective ones. Fuel poverty, defined as a household having to spend 10% of its income on heating is far too high in Scotland. On that, I think we are all agreed, even the Scottish Government. The report of the Fuel Poverty Strategic Working Group notes that the high rate of fuel poverty in Scotland is largely unchanged since 2009, so quite what it has to do with the United Kingdom Government sanctions, I don't know, but has doubled since the Scottish Government's fuel poverty target was set in 2002. And that is a target, of course, which there is now no chance of the Scottish Government meeting, not at the moment, Minister. Our amendment to Labour's motion makes plain what we would seek to do about this. We need, in our view, to introduce a clear target to achieve a transformative change uh, in energy efficiency across Scotland. And in our view, and this was in our manifesto this year, the target should be that all properties achieve a C rating or above in their energy performance certificate or EPC by the end of the next decade at the latest. Now, in order to achieve that, transform, that transformational change, significant levels of capital investment will be required. Accordingly, we would like to see the energy efficiency budget line of the Scottish Government's capital budget allocations increase year on year. This means capital infrastructure investment rising from this year's £80 million, under 3% of the budget, to more than £300 million by the end of this Parliament, a cumulative £1 billion over the next five years. Yes. Ash Denham. The member will acknowledge that we have heard this morning in the Finance Committee about the serious challenges to the Scottish budget coming from Westminster, you know, billions of pounds of cuts ahead of us. Where would uh, the member suggest that the Scottish Government take the money from in order to put it into this? Adam I'm, I'm delighted that Ashton uh, asks that question because uh, what we also heard, of course, in the Finance Committee uh, this morning, although perhaps she chose not to listen to this inconvenient truth, uh, it was the evidence from Professor Anton Muscatelli that there will be significant uh, capital expenditure um, on its uh, way. Uh, the, uh, minister, the member can, of course, check the record to see what uh, Professor Muscatelli said in her uh, own time. So people living in a home with low energy performance are three and a half times as likely to be suffering from pure fuel poverty as those in a home with high energy performance. Out of Scotland's 2.5 million homes, 1.4 million are below EPC band C, of which 400,000 are in the worst rated bands. That's why we strongly agree with the conclusion of the, of the Fuel Poverty Strategic Working Group that the aim should be to eliminate, to eliminate poor energy performance as a driver of fuel poverty. Now, we recognise, of course, that fuel poverty cannot be tackled by improved energy efficiency alone, central though that must be if we are to be successful. And that's why we consider that winter fuel payments and cold weather payments, which are among the social security powers to be devolved to this Parliament under the Smith Commission Agreement, should be protected, albeit that, as we've said before, consideration should be given to the time of year when the former are paid. But on the role of social security in the context of fuel poverty, um, I note that the report of the Fuel Poverty Strategic Working Group says the following, and I quote, while the social security system can provide immediate and very welcome relief for poor households, long-term solutions to raising incomes depend on thriving local economies, supporting well-paid, secured jobs. And we must also have the skills and capacity throughout Scotland to take up these opportunities, unquote. And on these benches, we could not agree more with these observations. Energy efficiency programmes can assist with local economic development and employment, and to achieve this there is an urgent need to work with the skills and development sectors uh, and Scotland's economic and business development agencies so that, as the working group puts it, there are trained workers coming out of colleges to work in local firms to deliver policy goals on energy and fuel policy. And in particular, the following actions are called for. Public procurement for energy efficiency schemes should give priority to local businesses and workers. Our enterprise agencies should promote and support local businesses to deliver such schemes. And Skills Development Scotland and Scotland's colleges should collaborate uh, on developing the required skills. And here it is important to note that the Fuel Poverty Strategic Working Group records the concern that the reduction in further education college places will have a negative impact on filling the skills gap, something which we've been saying on this side of the aisle for some time. Finally, presiding officer, there is of course the issue of energy prices. 
No debate on fuel poverty can overlook this aspect of the matter, which is why I was particularly pleased to see reported just yesterday that new measures designed to cap household energy bills are being considered as we speak by the UK Government. Greg Clark, uh, Theresa May's Business Secretary, said that the energy companies, and I quote, must treat customers properly or be made to do so. And I agree uh, with UK ministers that the government should not shy away from imposing new measures, aimed particularly at cutting the number of households stuck on so-called standard variable tariffs, the most expensive uh, available. Um, I move the amendment in my name. I now call on Andy Whiteman to speak to and move amendment 2504.2. Seven minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and uh, can I thank also Labour for bringing uh, this debate. Uh, it's clear that there is an unprecedented level of support across this chamber to bring about an end to fuel poverty, and that's clearly welcome. I want to start my contribution by thinking a little bit differently about our housing stock. Uh, many houses and tenements across Scotland have stood for 100 years or more. Indeed, the Scottish Fuel Poverty Strategic Working Group estimates that 85% of the homes that we will be using in 2050 have already been built. And with some investment and maintenance, they can remain homes for another century. In this sense, Scotland's housing stock is not a private asset. We pay to occupy our homes during our lifetime, certainly, but they represent vital infrastructure that should last across generations. And thus, houses are as much part of the public infrastructure as the streets and the public buildings, and we should be stewarding them as a public good for future generations, and I think we should include, in order to achieve that, a review of the legislation underpinning common property. As we've heard, the ambitious fuel poverty target set by the Liberal, Labour, Liberal Democrat coalition and taken up by the SNP administration has been missed and has now expired. Across the country, almost 50% of Scottish homes fail basic quality standards. This is quite an incredible statistic, and we know from other statistics that over a third of Scottish households are classed as fuel poor. People struggling to heat their homes face higher risks of poor health and lower educational attainment, as well as the added stress of having to make difficult choices between heating and putting the food on, tab on the table or buying a new school uniform. Presiding officer, in previous sessions of this parliament, uh, my Green colleagues have had success in encouraging the Scottish Government to take bolder steps to address fuel poverty. Greens consistently made fuel poverty a priority in our budget negotiations and helped deliver £77 million more for fuel poverty programmes in the last session. Uh, my colleague Alison Johnson, along with campaigners such as WWF Scotland, helped to secure energy efficiency as a Scottish Government national investment priority. My amendment today is a call to make that national investment priority a reality. We can do that by accepting housing as one of our most important public assets, as I say, by using the policy tools available to us and by a level of investment that unlocks the benefits of warm homes. The Scottish Government's current commitment works out at 125 million per year across this parliament. That's useful, but in real terms, it will amount to a standstill investment by the end of this parliament. To deliver the full benefit that warm homes can deliver for everyone with the benefits of better health, fewer emissions, reduced energy bills and more jobs, Parliament will have to sign off a budget that, as the motion says, is part of a progressive long-term increase in the fuel poverty and energy efficiency budgets. Along with public support, the wealth tied up in buildings themselves needs to be harnessed for repairs. The REAPS regulations are vital, and there are a host of other ways to make improvements on houses at point of sale affordable. Part of the cash released when a house is sold could be directed towards improvements by statute. It does not take much in the way of capital gains to accrue the £2,672 that government statisticians expect it would take to pay to bring the average house in the lowest three EPC bands up to a D rating. Utilising the wealth that property accrues to make the house warm and watertight is an excellent use of capital gains, and setting minimum standards across the private sector means all houses that fall below the threshold will be affected and the requirements for energy efficiency improvements will be priced into the market. Thus, we are disappointed that the SNP manifesto only talks about regulating the private rented sector when the problems are just as acute in the privately owned sector. The Scottish Greens manifesto followed the existing Homes Alliance recommendation of EPCC by 2025, and so we'll be supporting the Conservative amendment today. 
Recent legislation in both England and Wales has identified a similar goal with landlords facing restrictions on issuing a lease on property that fails to meet the basic standards from April 2020. The UK Government can also help us by ending the madness whereby new houses pay a zero rate of VAT, but repairs to existing homes are charged at 20%. The Swedish Government is due to vote next month on a proposal to end VAT charges on appliance repairs before extending this to home repairs. We know that existing homes are the most important sector to tackle, but new build homes are also worth addressing. Presiding officer, Scottish Green land reform proposals in our manifesto were designed to deliver thousands more affordable quality homes for the same amount of cash that the SNP plans to commit. Allowing councils to purchase land at existing use value for affordable housing rather than the inflated prices after planning permission is granted will free up around 30% of the cost of an average new house to invest in higher standards. This model was used in the UK until the 1950s and is still used in countries such as Germany. The SNP amendment notes we have more than 100 recommendations from two expert groups to consider and commits to a fuel eradic poverty eradication strategy by 2017. We are happy to support that amendment too. One of the issues raised by the recommendations was a tightening of the definition of fuel poverty. And this echoes the views of the government's poverty advisor, Naomi Eisenstadt, that the definition of fuel poverty is up, needs to be updated to ensure that support is better targeted towards those on low incomes. We are open to this change. Yep. Kevin thank Mr Whiteman for giving way and I, I thank him for bringing up the point of the definition and I think the independent review um, which will be completed by summer 2017 uh, will help us in terms of our consultation on the fuel poverty strategy to bring us forward to those statutory fuel poverty targets that we want. Does he agree that it's right that we have that independent review? We have it now and that reports back in summer 2017 uh, before we move to the new statutory fuel poverty target. Andy Whiteman. We are very happy to support any efforts to ensure that the, tar the de definition of fuel poverty is better targeted towards those on low incomes. Finally, I want to close uh, by noting that addressing fuel poverty is at least as much about helping households as it is about treating homes, as well as repairing and improving the energy efficiency of homes occupied tho by those in fuel poverty. We need to do much more to address the social and economic problems that cause uh, these uh, the fuel poverty and are exacerbated by it. These include poor physical and mental health, lower levels of education, socialisation and rurality. This requires a move away from traditional modes of delivering energy efficiency measures and towards much greater engagement with the frontline services able to better identify and support those in greatest need. I move the amendment in my name. Uh, we now move to the open speeches. Can I say to you, time is really tight, so please conclude within the six minutes even if you have taken interventions. And I call Jackie Bailey to be followed by Ben McPherson. Presiding officer, I'm very pleased to contribute to Scottish Labour's debate on fuel poverty. But let me firstly declare an interest. I'm the Honorary Vice President of Energy Action Scotland, proud to be part of such a fine organisation that campaigns to eradicate fuel poverty. But I'm also very proud to have been the minister that set the target to eradicate fuel poverty in the Housing Scotland Act of 2001. <laughs> I hope that's not included in my time, presiding officer. <laughs> Scottish Labour brought forward a statutory commitment to eradicate fuel poverty within 15 years. It was bold, it was ambitious, and yes, it was challenging. But not one party, not one party said we couldn't do it. Every party gave their un unanimous backing to the Housing Scotland Act, even the SNP. In fact, at committee, they said that 15 years was too long, and they wanted to do it in eight. Now, I applaud ambition, but the SNP really have no excuse here. They've been in power for almost a decade. They were responsible for achieving the target for two thirds of the time that the target existed. Levels of fuel poverty now are more than double those that existed when we set the target to eliminate fuel poverty by November 2016. Why did the SNP leave it until after the Scottish Parliament elections to tell us what everyone knew, that they would fail to meet the target? In fact, Energy Action Scotland, the government's own fuel poverty task force, have been telling them for a few years now that they needed to accelerate spending if there was to be any hope of ending fuel poverty. And did the SNP listen? What did they do, I hear you ask? They cut the budget. They cut the budget 
for 2016-17 by 15 million. I know they blame it on Westminster, but you know what? If it's important to you, you make resources available. The Minister a couple of weeks ago announced funding of 10 million, and of course that's welcome. I don't know whether this is additional or not. Let's be honest, taking 15 million away, replacing it with 10 million is still a cut and therefore deserves no praise. So let me turn to the future. And I want to start by thanking the Scottish Fuel Poverty Strategic Working Group, thanking the Scottish Rural, Rural Fuel Poverty Task Force. They have produced reports with a range of recommendations that provide a very helpful framework on which to proceed. High level recommendations, backed by detailed actions. And I really do not understand why the SNP government need more time to think about this before setting a target. Now, I am old enough to recall that the government tried to reset the definition before. In fact, I remember last year a senior civil servant coming to the Energy Action Scotland conference telling us about the detail of that new definition. The task force is itself an expert group. Why do you need to commission more expert consultation on this? Is this simply an excuse for a delay? I will in a minute. I want you to answer this question because the very first thing I think the SNP government need to do is to reset the target, not introduce a new target which might be different, which could say we'll halve fuel poverty in 50 years. I want you to reset the target to eradicate fuel poverty. I'll give way to the Minister, yes or no, will he do that? Th Kevin I thank Ms Bailey for giving way. Um, the reason why we're having the independent review is that was one of the recommendations in the report. Uh, and that's the way that we will uh, set that definition. From that, we'll then consult and then we'll introduce that new, strat that new statutory target to eradicate fuel poverty in Scotland. Jackie Bailey. It's very clear. I asked a simple question. He could have said yes. He could have said no. He said neither. Instead, he chose to take up lots of time. So we do need a new, not a new target. We need to reset the original target to end fuel poverty. It is important that the Cabinet Secretary or the Minister commits to that on the record before the debate is concluded. We need a strategy with actions, lead responsibility. No, I've heard enough from you already. But let me make a plea to the Minister in the Cabinet Secretary, because I know everybody wants to count the number of homes improved, the number of energy efficient light bulbs that are distributed, even the width of the insulation installed. You know, I understand the SNP are even concerned with the spaces in a Toblerone bar. And here was I, always thinking that they were in favour of more separation, not less. But to be serious, this should be about the outcomes, not the inputs. We should measure the difference it makes to people rather than measuring things. Our ambition should be nothing short of ending fuel poverty. And to do that, we need a step change in policy. Let me go back to the Minister's announcement to illustrate the point. £10 million was to secure improved energy efficiency for 14,000 homes. Now, that's great. But at that rate, it would take us 60 years to end fuel poverty. What else did the minister have to say in his release? He led with changing the definition of fuel poverty. That's the SNP's priority. Tinker with the definition. Little indication of the bold and decisive action required. This Scottish Parliament presiding officer has a swathe of new powers coming in April. Powers on taxation, powers on social security. Oh wait, we don't want those just yet. And powers over the energy company obligation. This is a real opportunity to do things differently, to recalibrate the system. The question is, is the SNP up to the task? Fuel poverty now stands at 845,000 households. That's a disgrace. This government should get on with it. Ben McPherson to be followed by Alison Harris. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I also welcome the opportunity to speak, and I'm grateful for Labour for bringing this issue to the Chamber today. Presiding Officer, when I think of the issue of fuel poverty, I think in particular of a young lad in my constituency, Darren, who I met during the campaign. Before the election, at the end of a community event that I was taking part in, he came over to me and said softly but clearly, Ben, it's brilliant that the SNP are building so many more warm, affordable homes, but please make sure the government also keeps spending money on older houses too. Some are still damp and cold sometimes. I think of Darren today and how together we have a responsibility to do what we can 
to get to a point where every child like him grows up in a house that's warm and dry and safe. And I'm glad that we feel that collective responsibility today. And while I acknowledge that there's always more work that we can do as parties and as individuals, back in the spring, I was glad to be able to say to Darren, as I'm able to remind the chamber today, that the SNP is absolutely committed to a child poverty bill and a warm homes bill. And as we heard from the minister earlier, these will be delivered in the next few years. These pieces of legislation will make a difference. They will help other people. And as MSPs, we should all work together to make sure those acts are as meaningful and beneficial as possible. And I look forward to playing my full part in that. Presiding officer, I think it's also worth repeating that to date the SNP Scottish Government has spent unprecedented amounts on action to address fuel poverty and increase energy efficiency. 650 million towards tackling fuel poverty since 2009 and 1 billion more will be invested before 2021 to make homes and buildings warmer and cheaper to heat. Also, presiding officer, it is my strong view that as politicians, we must always reflect on the past and consider context and circumstance as we analyse the present and look to build a better future. Therefore, we must examine the issue of fuel poverty and the fuel poverty that exists today as a consequence of the dilapidation and reduction of affordable housing stock in the 1980s and 1990s. We must view it as a result of the pressure and UK government cuts since the financial crisis of 2008. We must analyse it as a symptom of the destructive effect of years of ideological Westminster austerity and evaluate it as a manifestation of welfare reform and the persistent negative effects of low pay and growing income and wealth inequality. Presiding officer, these circumstances are a result sometimes of external events but they are also in many ways a result of UK government policy. And that is why I'm proud that in Scotland we are taking action to both mitigate the effects of these issues and proactively change the circumstances of today. I'm proud that the Scottish Government are using the powers of devolution to address fuel poverty where and when it can. That's why I welcome that the Scottish Government will invest 0.5 billion over the next few years to tackle fuel poverty and improve energy efficiency, contributing over 100 million this year alone. It's why I also welcome that the Scottish Government will invest more in meaningful schemes like HEAPS, which last year saved 8 million in fuel bills and helped 30,000 households. And I also welcome an ad the additional 10 million to help families who most need support to keep warm this winter. And it'll be interesting to see how the trial of that fund goes and whether it can be utilised elsewhere in Scotland. Presiding officer, the Scottish Government are investing heavily to help households in fuel poverty across Scotland, like Dar and I met during the campaign and spoke of earlier. And I welcome that unprecedented investment and support. Presiding officer, judging by the amendments lodged today and most of the opening remarks, although there was some unhelpful tribalism, it is clear that we are unified as MSPs about wanting to tackle fuel poverty. We should take strength from that and debate constructively for the rest of today. And remember that we achieve more when we cooperate. We should collaborate to tackle fuel poverty as both the Scottish Fuel Poverty Strategic Working Group Report and the Scottish Rural Fuel Poverty Task Force Report call on us to do. That is what the experts have called on us to do. And in that spirit, presiding officer, I'd like to make mention to a recent expiring example of how collective political effort can make a difference to support communities. Last week, my constituents in Lawn Street and Leith received some very good news. After facing eviction by a common landlord for over a year, the community are all now secure in their homes and looking forward to Christmas. With extraordinary campaigning by the community, cross-party political support from myself, my predecessor Malcolm Chisholm, Andy Whiteman, MSP and others, from proactive local authority involvement, action by a dynamic housing association who are taking over the properties and vital assistance from the Scottish Government and Housing Minister Kevin Stewart. As a team, as a collective, we achieved a very positive outcome for nearly 100 people who were in a really difficult situation. It was a real triumph for the common good. <laughs> Presiding officer, the people of Lawn Street will always inspire me. The positive outcome last week not only reminded me of what communities can achieve together when they take action and support each other, but it also emphasised to me so strongly what we as politicians 
can achieve when we work together and focus on people instead of party politics. It was collaborative politics at its best. The title of today's debate is Supporting Local Communities. So let's take action from the Lawn Street example and work together more to support the communities we represent because that is how we'll make the biggest difference. That's how we'll best tackle fuel poverty and all other forms in poverty. That's how we'll build a better Scotland and a fairer Scotland for all the young people like Darren I met in the campaign. Thank you. Alison Harris to be followed by Ruth Maguire. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to contribute to this debate on an issue that still affects far too many Scottish households. Indeed, figures suggest that one third of households are living in fuel poverty, struggling to maintain their homes at a temperature suggested by the Scottish House Condition Survey, with an even higher figure in rural areas. In 2016, this is simply not good enough. As we've already heard, in June, the, in June this year, the Scottish Government finally admitted that it would not achieve its long-held target to end fuel poverty by November 2016, this month. But it's yet to give a new date and an updated commitment for the fuel policy, uh, fuel, uh, yes, fuel policy eradication. Until the last minute, assurances were given by ministers that the November target was on track despite expert bodies predicting that the aim was unachievable with the resources being allocated to the problem. Fuel poverty blights over one third of Scottish households. 11% of homes suffer from dampness or condensation and the SNP government's response is to slash the fuel poverty energy efficiency budget by over 13%. They promised 119 million in 2016, uh, sorry, 2016-17 budget, but yet only 103 million is allocated in the draft budget. A cut by the SNP of almost 16 million. Jackie Bailey is quite correct. And no, I'm sorry, I don't have enough time. And this despite the fact that cold homes can cause increased costs for the NHS by way of increased health issues, including an increased risk of heart attack, mental health issues, as well as respiratory problems and asthma. All of which are among the many conditions made worse as a result of cold, damp homes. In 2008, Professor Christine Liddell of the University of Ulster reported that for every pound spent on reducing fuel poverty, the NHS saved 42 pence. Spending money on homes occupied by pensioners could well lead to an even larger savings in the NHS. Often those who can be affected the most are children and health issues can lead to more days off school and lower educational performance, a contributor in continuing the cycle of poverty. As an important means of tackling the problem, energy efficiency of Scottish houses needs to be improved, with almost 60% falling into performance band D or worse. Improving the energy efficiency of homes to an EPC rating of C or better would transform the lives of many of our fellow Scots, but it needs funding and it needs government commitment. It needs the government to engage in improving energy efficiency with owner-occupiers and housing providers, public and private, so that no group falls behind just because of the nature of their tenancy. No, I've no time, I'm sorry. Individuals should be given more information and be encouraged through grants and loans to make their homes more energy efficient. Deputy Presiding Officer, Scottish Conservatives recognise the need to improve energy efficiency in all Scottish homes to at least a C rating and to provide the capital investment needed to reach this goal. The budget for energy efficiency needs to rise. It needs to be double the proposed investment that the government has set aside. Conservatives call for an investment of £1 billion over five years in Scottish homes that could lead to real health, educational and social benefits. The SNP government can show far more ambition in how it is going to address the problem. It can set targets and allocate sufficient funding. It also needs to look at all forms of generating power efficiently and to keep bills low. And of course, it can give a clear commitment to protect winter fuel and cold weather payments once they are devolved to this parliament. Continued support needs to be given to the excellent bodies such as Home Energy Scotland, which offers free and impartial advice on energy efficiency, pointing householders in the direction of available grants and other energy support and help to heat, offering free and discounted gas connections to those in low incomes and vulnerable. 
These bodies make a valued contribution in the fight for warmer homes. Groups such as Energy Action Scotland do a great job in continuing to flag up fuel poverty as an issue, campaigning for its eradication without fear or favour. They too have called on the Scottish Government to redraw the fuel poverty strategy and reset target dates following the publication in October of the reports from two short life groups set up by the Scottish Government, the Scottish Fuel Poverty Strategic Working Group and the Rural Fuel Poverty Task Force. Grand titles, but let us see real progress begin in this issue. Real progress towards all properties reaching at least an EPCC rating. Real progress towards bringing forward warm homes legislation. A recent press release from Energy Action in Scotland concluded by reiterating that people across Scotland want to know that one day the right that everyone has to be able to live in a warm, dry home at a price they can afford will be a reality. The government needs to do far more in addressing this problem. It needs to tell us the revised target date and tell us whether or not it will match the commitment of the Scottish Conservatives to eradicate this problem. We need a response that is not based on the misplaced targets of the past, but a realistic, well-funded plan with a clear timetable to ensure that the aim of having all Scottish homes free of fuel poverty is achieved. Thank you. Thank you. I call Ruth Maguire to be followed by Mark Griffin. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak in this debate about the hugely important issue of fuel poverty. It's clear we agree across this chamber on the severity of the issue and on the urgent need to tackle it. I welcome the recent reports and recommendations from both the Fuel Poverty Strategic Working Group and the Rural Fuel Poverty Task Force, which will be instrumental for the Scottish Government as it works towards a new strategy on eradicating fuel poverty. As we go forward, it's important to keep in mind that the issue of fuel poverty is a highly complex and multifaceted one one to which there's no simple solution and for which no single agency can address by itself. Indeed, this was stated in both reports. Chair of the Strategic Working Group, David Sigworth, for example, highlighted recent increases in the underlying costs of fossil fuel due to devaluation as an exacerbating factor, something over which the Scottish Government does not have control. The chairman of the Rural Fuel Poverty Task Force, Di Alexander, meanwhile, stressed how both the UK and Scottish governments, as well as Ofgem and other major utility companies, all have, and I quote, crucial roles to play in eliminating the scourge of rural fuel poverty. Indeed, multiple recommendations in both reports explicitly identify bodies other than the Scottish Government, such as the UK Government or Ofgem, as the lead organisations or responsible party for an action. Now, I only mention this to underline the scale and complexity of the issue of fuel poverty and the cooper cooperation across many different organisations and areas that it demands, and th thus the limit that any one body can achieve working alone. Where the Scottish Government has influence, however, there can be no doubt that it's ready and willing to play its part. To quote from the report of the Strategic Working Group, the high levels of fuel poverty exist despite commendable investment by the Scottish Government in energy efficiency programmes to alleviate fuel poverty. The establishment of the two short life independent strategic working groups and the reports published by them cited in this motion represent just one example of the serious commitment of this government to do all that it can to eradicate fuel poverty and to increase energy efficiency, in particular in rural communities where the risk of fuel poverty is unfortunately all the higher. Just a few weeks ago, the government announced an additional £10 million of funding to help families in my own constituency of Cunningham South and across Scotland who need most support to keep warm this winter. Nine million of this will be allocated to housing associations and councils to improve the housing of some of the poorest households and those most in need. This brings the total amount spent by this government on directly tackling fuel poverty to £113 million this year alone. The, remain, the remaining one million of this most recent funding has been made available to provide grants to households to help meet the costs of installing energy efficiency measures. These are only the most recent actions taken by the government and there's not time to cite all of the achievements of this SNP government since 2007. But by way of illustration, a few facts serve to highlight the work that has been done. Since 2009, over 650 million has been allocated to tackling fuel poverty 
More than one million energy efficiency measures have been installed in almost one million households across Scotland since 2008. And in 2015, more than £8 million was saved in fuel bills thanks to home energy efficiency programmes, the scheme covering 30,000 households. Presiding officer, this government has spent unprecedented amounts on fuel poverty and energy efficiency, and the Scottish Government is giving more help to people to combat fuel pover poverty than any other administration in the UK. Looking to the future, it's clear that the Scottish Government is focused on building what has already been achieved. It is committed to making half a billion pounds available to tackle fuel poverty and improve energy efficiency over the next four years. This means by the end of this parliamentary term in 2021, the government will have committed more than one billion to making our homes and buildings warmer and cheaper to heat. Energy efficiency has been designated as a national infrastructure priority. The cornerstone of this, Scotland's energy efficiency programme, will commence fully in 2018, with pilots already underway in 11 areas with particularly high levels of fuel poverty. Returning to the main topic of today's motion, the initial response of the government to the recommendations of the reports of the working group and the task force makes clear that it's more focused than ever on eradicating fuel poverty. A key recommendation of the strategic working group's report was to review the very definition of fuel poverty to ensure that it is as effective and constructive as possible moving forward. The government has already announced the setting up of the independent expert review to do just that, and I firmly welcome the decisive response of the government to this most fundamental and urgent of the recommendations in the report. Reviewing the definition of fuel poverty is a vital step in making sure that future action really makes a difference to those who need it most and will pave the way for closer and effective consideration of the other recommendations of the report. In total, the two reports make over 100 recommendations, and these should now be carefully considered, together with the results of the independent review of the definition of fuel poverty, as the government develops a new and effective eradication strategy for 2017. I look forward to supporting the Scottish Government and working with colleagues across the Chamber as we aim to tackle fuel poverty, taking into account the wider picture of income, energy costs, energy use and energy efficiency, all of which feed into fuel poverty. Thank you. Mark Griffin to be followed by John Mason. Thank you, President Officer. After a, a decade in power, there are no excuses for the SNP failing to deal with fuel poverty. Today, too many still have to choose between fuel and food. In October, the Scottish Fuel Poverty Strategic Working Group <coughs> confirmed what we've known for a long time. The target on eradicating fuel poverty will be missed. In the most recent statistics for 2014, published last December, 845,000 households were fuel poor. 35% of all households. And in November, Witch and Unite published details of the scale of just how much customers are overpaying energy companies by failing to switch. Witch said UK consumers are collectively overpaying by £1.4 billion for their energy, while 16 million people, over half of energy customers, are stuck on standard tariffs. At the Energy Action Conference, Unite said research had showed a move to a publicly owned energy system in the UK would pay for itself within 10 years and could save households around £158 a year in their bills. Off, the, the, the poor energy efficiency of Scotland's existing housing stock is an important issue for tackling fuel poverty and climate change. The vast majority of households living in the draftiest, leakiest homes are also living in fuel poverty. Around 50% of Scotland's climate change emissions come from the demand for heat. We led the debate when we promised a, a Warm Homes Act to help to tackle fuel poverty by driving up energy and insulation standards. The government also committed to the same legislation, but plans for a bill were missing from the programme for government. By supporting the growth of district heating and renewable heat, and helping to improve the energy efficiency of our homes, a Warm Homes Act would provide the framework for the next generation of domestic renewables to develop. That would provide confidence and certainty to the renewables industry to develop innovative district 
and micro solutions. And as I said already, over half of Scotland's energy consumption is accounted for by our demand for heat, yet less than 4% of that comes from renewables and only 1% is provided by district heating. And while the government is right to aim for all new fossil fuel power plants to be equipped and existing plants to be adapted for carbon capture and storage, and we could be much more ambitious. We should push for those plants to become co-generating, to get away from the current situation in which, according to Scottish Government figures, only 35% of fossil fuel is converted to electricity and 65% of that energy is then lost as waste heat. A co-generating plant where electricity is generated and the heat that is normally wasted and pumped in, into the sea is instead pumped into neighbouring communities as hot water um, for district heating schemes. That can operate at levels of efficiency close to 90%. And that level of um, increased efficiency would go a long way towards achieving the government's target to reduce energy consumption. And at the same time, it would lift thousands of families out of fuel poverty in surrounding communities, allowing the government to then concentrate resources in other areas. The presiding officer, I, I also wanted to talk about communities who are off the gas network. Um, there are many rural communities or urban communities on the edge of uh, bigger towns which are affected. And industry has been critical of the design of energy performance certificates and the standard assessment procedure methodology for over a decade. Since the main measure of the EPC is based on running costs um, and as such they're unreliable as a measure of energy efficiency in off gas grid areas. The current EPC system in Scotland gates houses by their notional cost of providing energy for heating and hot water per square metre. The SAP methodology doesn't reflect the efficiency savings which, which can be made by switching from storage heaters to electrical boilers and heating systems. So we have a situation in Scotland where local authorities are then forced to install expensive storage heaters when building new houses or replacing existing heating systems, rather than new technology, which would save households money, just because they need to install a system with the best flawed SAP score. And in November 2014, the Telegraph reported that rural householders had paid over £40 million into the energy company obligation, and yet had received, on average, less than two pounds per household in return. Um, since the ECO is funded via a levy on consumer bills, the cost burden has been disproportionately carried by off-grid gas, con off gas grid consumers who are failing to benefit from those schemes. And I think now that the government is taking over responsibility for that scheme in Scotland, they'd be interested to know how they plan to support off-gas grid um, customers. Presiding officer, we believe that the government could do so much more when it comes to addressing fuel poverty, resetting the target to eliminate it and bringing forward a warm homes bill next year would be a good start. John Mason to be followed by Annie Wells. Hey, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Clearly, we're looking at some fairly lengthy reports today, and I have to say I fully agree with the government view that we need to take time to consider them properly before deciding exactly what action to take. Now, hopefully we can all agree here that fuel poverty is a big problem, and we can also agree it is not easy to solve or it would have been done so by now. So we get a nonsense statement from Jackie Bailey, like you just make the resources available, but what she actually means is she would have to cut the health service or cut colleges or something else if she wants to put more money into housing. You cannot just make resources available unless Jackie Bailey is going to tell us how you make resources available. Jackie Bailey. I think if the member was paying close attention, which I would encourage him to do, we were talking about £15 million being replaced by £10 million. It's a cut of £5 million. If the government cared, £5 million is small change in their overall budget. John Mason. Yeah, I would give more credence to Jackie Bailey's uh, speeches if she didn't uh, also demand more money for this and more money for that and more money for the next thing. 
Now, clearly we face a range of moving targets, one of the most recent being the devaluation of the pound, which is likely to lead to higher fuel prices in due course. Now, I particularly agree with the report from Fuel Poverty Strategic Working Group when it talks about the four drivers of fuel poverty, namely incomes, energy costs, energy performance, and how energy is used in the home. I also agree that all four are important and we must deal with energy costs, performance, and how energy is used. For example, if a major repair work is needed in a home, grants and loans are likely to be needed, even for people on reasonable incomes. But actually, most people should have sufficient income to pay for routine maintenance and their actual fuel costs without needing extra outside help. I think sometimes we debate issues too much in silos. Of course, the living wage is a good thing and sanctions are a bad thing in themselves, but they are not standalone issues. One of the reasons these are, these, both of these issues are respectively good and bad is that by improving them, people can afford to live and pay out of their own decent income for a minimum standard of living. I was particularly struck by the statement in 3.1 of the report that, quote, in some cases, low-income households live in social housing with good energy performance, yet are still fuel poor. 19% of fuel poor households live in properties rated EPC band B or C, end of quote. The report then goes on to make five recommendations in relation to income. They, they go from three to seven, the way the report is structured. Three is to make sure people are getting the benefits they're entitled to. Five talks about training places and job opportunities. Six and seven are more about energy policy and energy projects. But the other one, the remaining one, is number four. And it says that we should review welfare and social security policies, both devolved and reserved, and in particular suggests that the Scottish living wage and social security policies should work together to ensure a basic living standard for every household. Presiding officer, I believe that this is absolutely key. If we take sanctions as an example, these are reducing people's income to unsustainable levels. Everyone should have a guaranteed minimum income. We cannot have sanctions and end fuel poverty. That is so, it's, it's so frustrating, listening to the Tories making the kind of speeches they are. They support sanctions, therefore they support fuel poverty. When we as a society impose sanctions on an individual or family, we are deliberately putting them into fuel poverty. That is what happened in the film I, Daniel Blake, if you have seen it. Moving scenes of the young family moving into the house with no heating. Now, it appeared to be a fairly reasonable house, but they had no income to heat it because they had been sanctioned. Daniel Blake, to give them his due, then shows them how to use one candle to help keep themselves warm. Now, I've used the comparison before, but no one has convinced me it is wrong, so I will use it again. If the worst people in our society are criminals, and they are guaranteed a reasonable level of warmth in prison, how can we not guarantee that same minimum to every family? As far as I know, we cannot sanction prisoners by switching their heating off, so how can we sanction decent families by switching their heating off? If I can just touch on one or two other uh, is issues in the time I've... Yes, absolutely. John Scott. Please accept that uh, his is the party of government, and these are the government's choices, and you've had 10 years to address this problem, and you've failed. I think John my main Mason. argument is that income is not the only, but it is one of the key factors in this, and I think his party are very guilty. There, there has to be a guaranteed level of income that cannot be sanctioned, and his party should be ashamed of the sanctions regime that they look over. I'm sorry, I think I am running out of time. Um, cl clearly, uh, with the pound going down, that's going to push fuel prices up, so that's going to hit uh, poorer people even more. Now, I think Andy Whiteman was referring to uh, private rented and owner occupiers uh, when he talked about getting repairs and maintenance done, which I also was going to mention, uh, because I think if we are to improve the housing stock, we need to look at maybe compulsory factoring and having somebody to lead in every property to get things improved. Presiding officer, finally, I note the recommendation to change the definition of fuel poverty as it has proved unhelpful to targeting those most in need. That is a valid argument, although the fear from some will be that someone will try and pretend that there's less of a problem than there actually is. So I welcome the government's commitment not to define away the problem and that there will be an expert independent review to see how we can make improvements. Presiding officer, there are certain essentials we should expect in a modern, developed society, which we claim you to must be. Close, Mr. Food Mr. and clothing are certainly two, but warm, dry accommodation has to be as well. Thank you.
Andy Wells, followed by Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Everyone in Scotland should be confident that they are, they are able to heat their homes, and that's why I welcome the Scottish Labour Party bringing this issue to the Chamber today. Over a third of households in Scotland are living in fuel poverty, according to the report by the Scottish Fuel Poverty Strategic Working Group. That is 845,000 households, and for rural areas, this figure hits a staggering 50%. Fuel poverty has almost doubled since 2003 and has since risen from the 25% figure as it was when the SNP-led government took office in 2007. The Scottish Conservatives have spoken a number of times on this issue, linking the issue with much higher chances of developing mental health problems, respiratory disease and other physical health issues. When it comes to health, for example, research shows that residents with bedroom temperatures at 21 degrees are 50% less likely to suffer depression and anxiety and those with temperatures of 15 degrees. And for children living in damp, mouldy homes are nearly three times more likely to develop symptoms of asthma. Certain demographics are more vulnerable than others and the annual winter mortality in Scotland report revealed that 2,850 people, the majority of whom were elderly, died as a result of being winter in 2015-16. This was the second highest number since 2008-09. Clearly, even though the detriments of fuel poverty are not always in the control of the government, either the Scottish or the UK, more, radi more radical action needs to be taken. We need clear statutory targets and timetables for action, and a transformative policy getting to the root of the problem. And that is what the Scottish Conservatives have proposed. As the report states, the quality of the house that you live in should never determine some people in Scotland paying disproportionately higher bills. Over 40% of social housing falls short of the Scottish housing quality standard with regards to all of its housing stock. And Scotland is falling short of the desired energy efficiency standards. For instance, around 60% of its properties are rated EPCD or worse, and that figure rises to 80% in rural areas. The answer lies in investment in energy efficiency measures, not only as a way of bringing down household bills, but also a way of reducing our carbon emissions. As well as measures by the UK government, as we have seen by the rollout of free smart meters across the UK, which will give consumers more control over their energy use, we should, as my, my colleague, I'm sorry, not at the moment, thanks. We should, as my colleague Adam Tompkins puts forward in his motion, have clear targets set by the Scottish Government. For instance, aiming for all the properties to achieve an EPCC rating or above by the end of the next decade would drastically improve energy efficiency in Scotland. And not only would this save money for the consumer, but it would entail a national programme with the potential to create 9,000 jobs in Scotland if completed by 2025. Significantly, as, ex as existing Homes Alliance points out, when compared with other national infrastructure projects, such an initiative would create job opportunities across Scotland. I welcome the Scottish Government's designation of energy efficiency as a national infrastructure priority, but in order to achieve the change we propose, we need to commit significant levels of capital investment to the project. The Scottish Conservatives have proposed gradually raising the energy efficiency budget to reach 10% of the Scottish Government's capital budget allocations. A bold capital infrastructure investment that would rise from this year's 80 million to 340 million by 2021, and totalling a combined £1 billion over the next five years. This is a policy that is supported by the Scottish Fuel Poverty Strategy Working Group report. In addition to grants and loans, we believe energy efficiency improvements should be reflected in the tax system. Specifically, energy efficiency improvements could be incentivised through LBTT discounts. Energy efficiency is, of course, not the only factor behind eradicating fuel poverty, which is why I want to reiterate the party's commitment to protecting the winter fuel payment and cold weather payments, other than, other than a reassessment of what times of the year it is paid when they are devolved to the Scottish Parliament. Energy companies are too in some way responsible for tackling this issue, which is why I welcome the UK Energy Secretary Greg Clark's decision to probe further into why the big six energy companies 
are making profits higher than they claim. And to conclude today, I want to highlight again the need to address fuel poverty in a bold and transformative way. The Scottish Government has designated fuel poverty as one of its main commitments, but we need clear timetables and targets in order to halt the downwards trend that we are seeing. Thank you. Alex Cole Hamilton to be followed by Claire Adamson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'd like to start by congratulating the Scottish Labour Party for bringing forward this very important debate. In January of this year, the Scottish Liberal Democrats led a similar debate in this chamber, calling for the Scottish Government to reverse cuts um, to its own fuel poverty budget and to revise its 2016 fuel poverty target, because uh, they were set to miss it by some margin. Yet this went unheeded and was voted down by the SNP. We've seen ministers cast aside advice from across this chamber and even from the experts. Repeatedly, they denied they were failing to meet their fuel po er uh, poverty eradication target, yet miss it they have, and there can be no hiding from this fact. Now, I would expect all members from across this parliament to agree that in Scotland, at this point in human civilised development, it is absolute travesty that families, particularly in our remote and rural communities, still have to choose between heating their homes and putting food on the table. We can only hope that now, unencumbered by their supermajority, the SNP will now listen to the solutions offered to it from across these benches. Scottish Liberal Democrats have sought uh, cross-party support in that debate uh, to achieve warmer, healthier home for every uh, single person in Scotland, and we do so again today. Introducing a Warm Homes Act alongside the establishment of catch-up zones uh, to deliver warmer homes in communities which have fallen behind is a plan that we must all get behind. Winter is coming, and so the government must act quickly to establish a new target to eradicate fuel poverty. Last year, Citizens Advice Scotland published their report still addressing the poverty premium, which brought to light the increased costs that those on low incomes often face. They are punished for not being able to afford internet access to secure the best deal for their energy and further discriminated uh, because of internet-only tariffs. They are further punished when energy companies are far more likely to give the best deals to those who can pay by direct debit and they, with guaranteed payments each month from consumers. Um, and, those, and they're further punished still by using, when using meters has a higher chance of being in financial difficulty. If you're in debt, that machine can have a voracious appetite. This is yet another frontier uh, where having resources can lead to savings, but having not, not having those resources can mean the opposite. Which is why the smart meter rollout is so crucial. It's an example of a national infrastructure project we need to see in order to help people out of fuel poverty. Helping people save money by showing how much energy they can save, whilst making this country more efficient. That households should, in Scotland, face such conditions is a national outrage. 25% of homes in our nation's capital, a third of homes across Scotland. Now, the World Health Organization attributes 30% of preventable deaths to cold and poorly insulated housing. Yet, in, the Scottish Government meets this reality with a £15 million cut to efforts to eradicate fuel poverty. We do well to remember the multidimensionality of this problem. Fuel poverty is demonstrably symptomatic and contributed to a wide range of negative and social lifestyle factors. Choosing to heat only certain rooms in a home can lead to overcrowding and with it the ready exchange of viruses and bacteria, whilst in turn causing a proliferation of damp and rot in rooms that go unheated. The Marmot Review in 2011 reported that fuel poverty in cold housing can have a damaging effect on mental health in all age groups, a reality underscored by the Warm Front Review, which revealed that following installation of heating and insulation improvements, residents were 40% less likely to report higher levels of psychological distress after that installation. Presiding officer, when the Scottish Government gets round to replacing the mental health strategy, which expired at the end of, the last, of last year, then ensuring that the mental well-being of our citizenry is underpinned by warm, dry places to live must be central to that. Incrementalism in the fuel poverty agenda has failed the most vulnerable communities in our society. It is time that this parliament meets the challenge of fuel poverty and bring us closer to fuel parity with the Warm Homes Act. 
only through legislation can we make meaningful progress to eradicate a social condition which should by rights be confined to the pages of a Dickens novel. Our ambition in this enterprise must be unfettered, with catch-up zones created as part of legislation to accelerate progress in our most deprived communities. And every aspect of our answer to this challenge needs to recognise the very specific needs and circumstances of rural and island communities. Presiding officer, the cost of our inactivity in this regard can be measured out in human lives, whereas the benefits of action are legion, with a step change reduction in our carbon emissions, job creation through infrastructure investment, and a measurable decline in demand for primary care while with a demonstrable improvement in our mental health. Presiding officer, the, the question should not be, can we afford to invest in our efforts to eradicate fuel poverty, but can we afford not to? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Cole Hamilton. Call Claire Adamson, followed by John Scott. Ms. Adamson, please. Um, thank you very much, um, Presiding Officer. Um, there's a few, few things more fundamental to human existence than uh, our housing. Indeed, Maslow's hierarchy of need has it as one of the physiological needs um, at the very lowest level of that hierarchy of esteem. And so it's very right that we are debating these issues this afternoon in the Parliament. I do want to talk about uh, an innovation uh, in my own area uh, in my speech, but um, I have to address some of the um, debate issues that have been raised this afternoon. Um, I really find it quite incredulous when I hear Conservative members on the benches express such concern on fuel poverty without any recognition of the contribution that their government has made to fuel poverty in this country. Much has been made of the government not meeting its target. Very few people have talked about the, the efforts that have been made towards reaching that target. But the government's had its hands tied behind its back because it's been working alongside uh, a Westminster government that is imposing fuel poverty on our citizens. Jackie Bailey said the cap of £5 million was pocket money to the government. In the last three months, the government has spent £9 million through the Welfare Fund on crisis grants supporting people in adverse poverty, including fuel poverty. And what about those families that have been affected by concentrics and the HMRC debacle looked over by HMRC? Cuts into their income, no, no way forward for appeals, the onus on them to prove their innocence, which has been proven by so many of them. Again, families pushed into fuel poverty. And there was again a, a concern for pensioners. Well, what about the 100,000 Scottish pensioners, the WASPy women, whose retirement plans and their income projections have been absolutely slashed by the plans of this Westminster government? So I would say to all colleagues on opposite benches, when you come to the chamber and demand more resources and money, please tell us which budget will be cut where is that money going to come from? Because anything less than that is just simply irresponsible. Presiding officer, what I did want to highlight today was um, uh, the BR Innovation Park in Ravenscraig in my area. Um, the British Research Establishment has been on the Ravenscraig site for a number of years. And uh, they have a demonstration development showcasing the future of sustainable housing, how it might look, but also includes a build of the very standard Forna Block Council housing, which has been used to demonstrate how older property can have fuel efficiency improved. And it demonstrates a mix of insulation, solar power, and um, different window systems that can help fuel efficiency in a traditional building. Uh, I've, might at this point invite the minister to come along and see BRE, but I was there with him just only a few weeks ago to also see it, the dementia friendly um, building that is there. But I do say to the members in, in, in the um, chamber, please come along and see some of the wonderful work that has been done demonstrating what can be done because Andy Whiteman was absolutely right. Less than 1% of, of our stock is being replaced each year. So the um, focus of this has to be uh, in and around our existing properties. And that um, is a European funded project. Um, it was done in conjunction with um, Belgium and Sweden and um, a, in partnership with Edinburgh University and Historic Scotland. 
I was invited there earlier this year by Robin Harter of WWF, Liz Marquis, the Director of Energy Agency, and also accompanied by the Policy Manager of the Association of Local Authority Chief Housing Officers. Um, and it was invited in their role as the Existing Homes Alliance um, to look and discuss some of the uh, information that they have in relation to this area. Alex. Mr Rowley. Madam for giving, for giving way, and, and can I say to her that I have been to Ravenscraig and I have, I have visited and agree with all the positive things she says there. Does she agree that the success in the public and social rented sector in housing needs to be replicated in the private rented sector and whether you rent publicly or rent privately, you should expect a certain standard in terms of energy efficiency? Ms Adamson. I do, I do agree that there has to be progress in the private rented sector, and I think that's a, a, an issue going forward, but we have improved building standards in those areas, and, uh, and I'm sure that um, tenants' rights, um, with the bill that was put through last year, private tenancies bill will, will uh, um, improve um, the opportunity for residents to raise concerns with private landlords. The project I was invited to see was with um, the uh, Energy Agency in Ayrshire, Ayrshire, who are working closely with the GPs in their area. The Energy Agency is a charity that is funded, uh, it successfully bid for the contract to manage the Energy Saving Scotland Advice Centre, and the Scottish Government um, now have the Managing the Energy Saving Trust money um, in that part of the, of, uh, the, the country, but they work with the GPs and take referrals specifically for concerns where people have um, a, a, any problems with their lungs in terms of COPD or indeed in asthma, and they work closely with the most at risk groups to ensure that they can have um, the best advice and the opportunity to access the, the um, home energy um, payments that are there. And we know how important that this is. Um, the um, AP PG in respiratory health in Westminster took um, evidence on this a few years ago about the, the, the difficulties um, in it and everyone agreed that um, COPD and asthma are, are worsened by colder houses so it's certainly a priority and I look forward to working with the Scottish Government going forward to eradicate fuel poverty. Thank you very much. I call John Scott who followed by Rhoda Grant. Mr Scott please. Thank you presiding officer. Presiding officer, fuel poverty is one of the biggest problems affecting Scotland today, and it's not getting any better on this SNP government's watch. With almost 60% of dwellings being rated band D or worse, is it any wonder health and mental health problems are on the increase in Scotland, particularly in rural Scotland? In Scotland, a higher proportion of households live in fuel poverty than anywhere else in the UK, with 35% of households or staggering the 845,000 homes living in fuel poverty. Astoundingly, since 2007, and since the SNP came into government, this figure, 845,000, has been reached on their watch, a figure which was only 586,000 homes when they first took office. Moreover, 229,000 houses are now in extreme fuel poverty, up from 172,000 since 2007. And the SNP government, as I have said today, should be hanging their head in shame. Indeed, some in the chamber today will recall Alex Salmond, MSP and then First Minister, saying on the 20th of September 2007, we are entirely committed to the statutory target to eradicate fuel poverty. That point was made by the minister yesterday. Well, compare that commitment made then with the reality today. Of course, none of these despairing statistics happen without a reason, and to use a traditional country expression, there is no need to look for complicated reasons when simple ones exist. And a simple explanation is that the government spending in this area is certainly reducing. Between the financial years 2015-16 and 2016-17, SNP government spending in this area will fall by 15.7 million as Jackie Bailey has pointed out. While Parliament has been told that 119 million was allocated to this problem in 2015-16, this year's projected figure is 103. Now, all of this is bad enough of it in itself, but the knock-on effects are what make failing to address fuel poverty so much worse. And I refer, as others have done, to the health of those living in fuel poverty, already described in part by Alec Rowley. Cold homes lead 
to respiratory and cardiovascular problems. Temperatures below 12 degrees have been shown to place strain on cardiovascular systems. For every one degree drop in room temperatures below five degrees, GP consultations for respiratory tract infections can increase by up to 19%. Staggering. It's well known that the respiratory diseases are responsible for about a third of excess winter deaths and cardiovascular diseases are responsible for about 48% of excess winter deaths. And excess winter deaths, they've even got an abbreviation, EWDs, are three times higher for those living in the coldest quarter of housing compared to those who live in the warmest quarter of housing. Heating, heating, Minister, is what makes the difference between living in a house or a home. Cold homes are also linked to increases in asthma amongst children. And children living in damp, mouldy houses are between 1.5 and three times more prone to coughing and wheezing than children who live in dry homes, been there myself. So there are, these are some of the facts. And I well recall John Swinney standing here in our parliament saying, we the SNP will spend to save. Well, here is a classic opportunity of spending to reduce fuel poverty, going a begging while our health service struggles with the consequences. I almost feel sorry for Shona Robinson who's constantly firefighting to keep our health service going and deal with the winter pressures. And yet our colleagues in cabinets are cutting the very budgets that would help keep people out of GP surgeries and are overburdened and sometimes overwhelmed hospitals, particularly in my constituency. The government really needs to wake up and smell the coffee or join the dots, pick whatever metaphor you want. But spending to reduce fuel poverty will be repaid many times over in the health of usually the most vulnerable in our society and also spending on fuel poverty will massively reduce demand in our NHS. So what's to be done? Adam Tompkins has already spoken about the need for transformational change and I would like to reinforce that view. And starting today, we should be seeking an EPC rating of C or above for all properties in Scotland, a target that should be achieved by 2030. As he has said, we need to commit significant capital investment to such a project with a percentage share of Dell capital budgets rising to 10% by the year 2021. Cumulatively, we propose that a billion pounds should be spent over the next five years to address this problem because we believe that those on the lowest incomes and living in the hardest to reach homes should be helped first. Energy efficient improvement should also attract relief through the council tax and business rate system, a manifesto commitment of ours in the past, as well as grants or loans being made available to those to deliver these required upgrades so, to so many properties in Scotland. Winter fuel payments and cold weather payments should be protected when they are devolved to the Scottish Parliament, although this is perhaps a less immediate prospect than was envisaged even a week ago. So in conclusion, presiding officer, we welcome this debate today in Labour's name because this debate draws attention to an issue the government are failing to address. It cannot be in anyone's or any government's interest to keep people in the poorest, dampest and coldest housing, yet that is what is happening. After almost 10 years in government, that is what has become the government's track record and it's failing those most in need. I can only hope that today's debate will spur the Scottish Government into action. And I again congratulate the Labour Party for bringing this matter to the attention of our Parliament. Thank you, President. Thank you, Mr Scott. I call Rhoda Grant to be followed by Richard Lockhead. And Mr Lockhead will be the last speaker in the open debate. Ms Grant, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, like others, it's desperately disappointing that the Scottish Government have failed to meet the target to end fuel poverty. And this is despite a fall in fuel prices because of the downturn in oil and gas. The previous Labour coalition, as Jackie Bailey pointed out, or should I say indeed Jackie Bailey set targets to eradicate fuel poverty, but that government put in place funding to do so as well. But this government has been cutting that funding for years and it also included carbon reduction targets as well as fuel poverty. Now, carbon reduction is a laudable aim but having it in the same target meant it worked against tackling fuel poverty. Funds for insulation and better heating systems are open to all rather than targeted at the fuel poor. We also know that those struggling to make ends meet neither have the time nor the inclination to search about for schemes and funding. And when they 
do find them, they also need money to contribute, and that makes it absolutely unattainable for them. When you're struggling just to put food on the table and to clothe your children, you've got very little time to look for solutions. That's why our response to fuel poverty needs to be proactive. We need advisors getting out to meet people and help them find solutions and also provide them with funding. Yesterday I heard of a wonderful initiative taking place in Sutherland. Every patient discharged from hospital is being offered a free home energy assessment. Many of these people will be elderly, they'll be in need of assistance in dealing with fuel efficiency, energy suppliers and insulation. It's a really simple initiative, but it could have an enormous impact on those people. We all know that fuel poverty is higher in rural areas in places like Sutherland. The Scottish Rural Fuel Poverty Task Force report states that over half of all rural and remote households live in fuel poverty, and that's a staggering statistic. There's a number of reasons for this. Firstly, income rates are often lower with people working a number of jobs, some seasonal, just to make ends meet. Many of these seasonal jobs are in the summer when people do not need the same level of heating. They're often underemployed, earning a great deal less when the cold weather sets in, making it much more difficult to afford to buy fuel. They're also often off gas grid and therefore don't have access to the cheapest form of fuel. Being off gas grid also means that they don't qualify for many of the schemes that are available to those who are on gas grid. Colour Gas have provided a briefing for this debate and I won't quote it but I recommend it as reading as it shows the, the disadvantage that policies from both our governments heap on those who live in off gas grid homes and are in fuel poverty by things like by having, allowing the big six to provide those schemes um, immediately um, pushes people out of, of, of their jurisdiction. Deprivation indicators also don't work well in rural areas as urban areas, so people don't qualify because they live in an area of deprivation. In many cases, they can't, um, those in fuel poverty can't afford the best alternative of gas grid, which is oil heating. Um, they can't afford either the price to install oil central heating or indeed the capital to fill up an oil tank. The government central heating scheme for elderly people wouldn't pay for oil-fired central heating systems and ask pensioners who already had been means tested to qualify for the scheme to find thousands of pounds to pay for the additional cost of oil-fired central heating and that was impossible for them to do so. Therefore, they're left, as are many others in rural and remote areas, with electric heating, and it's among the most expensive, but also among the most inefficient forms of heating. There's another reason for fuel poverty, and that's the quality of housing stock and its value. Many of the homes in rural Scotland are stone-built, storey-and-a-half houses. They're hard to heat and hard to insulate. And we are often told about high prices achieved on the open market for these houses, but those are only in the picturesque areas. For the most part, they have very little value, and indeed the cost of insulation is far greater than the finance that could be raised against the value of the house. Prices for insulation work in these hard-to-treat houses are high because only large contractors can jump through all the hoops that are required to become accredited fitters of that insulation. And we miss out twice here in rural areas because local companies, if they were accredited, would spend their income in the local area, boosting that economy. They would also be cheaper to employ because their workers would be living at home and smaller companies also have fewer overheads. It's a very practical solution that the Scottish Government needs to address. Add to the problem the temperatures in the countryside, and we all know from watching weather forecasts that they fall way below urban areas. There's also less, sh less shelter from high winds, therefore the need for heat and better insulation is greater. Presiding officer, the Scottish Government need to set new targets to eradicate fuel poverty, but more importantly, they really need to try and achieve this one. The target cannot just be a Scottish-wide one where treating urban areas becomes the best way of achieving it due to economies of scale. It needs to be set in smaller geographical areas where rural solutions are, are equitable, at least if not targeted specifically. Living in a cold, damp home affects our health, our ability to learn and our overall well-being. 
This is something that is crucial to all of us, and I very much hope that we can set a target to radical, eradicate fuel poverty, but this time that the Scottish Government will achieve it. Thank you very much. I call on Richard Lockhead. Mr Lockhead. I welcome the opportunity to make a, a brief contribution to this important debate. And I think we all agree that in 2016, the standards we'd expect would be at least that everyone living in our country would have a warm and comfortable home. And therefore, it's disappointing we're having this debate again in 2016, uh, given that we'd expect better. But that's for a range of complex reasons. And I do appreciate the spirit in which Alec Rowley approached the debate in his opening remarks. And it's just a shame that it went rather downhill for some of the other contributions from the opposition benches. I think it's yeah. utterly absurd for John Scott, backed up by Jackie Bailey and the Labour benches, to lay the blame at the SNP government for the rise in fuel poverty uh, in Scotland. Between 2010 and 2013, energy prices and fuel prices rose at eight times the rate of earnings. I'll just repeat that so they're all listening, that between 2010 and 2013, energy prices and fuel prices rose at eight times the rate of earnings. That period, and since then, has coincided with the Tory party's austerity budgets, where they've been cutting people's benefits and plunging people into poverty. So I say to the Tory party, it's not the SNP ministers that should be hanging their heads in shames, it's every single man and woman on the Tory benches in this parliament. If he wants to, I'll take an intervention. Mr Scott. The Cabinet, Richard Lockhead is uh, used to taking uh, responsibility for the actions of government, as he well knows. Uh, would he accept that the situation, poor as it is, as he has described, has happened while it's on his government's watch? Mr Lockhead. Well, as many members have made plain, there's a number of factors behind fuel poverty in Scotland, and many are the responsibility of the UK government yes. and indeed global energy prices, Correct. which I have to accept perhaps not even the UK government can control. Correct. And it's really important that when this is affecting real people's lives, that we have a really mature and honest debate in this parliament on this subject. And you cannot lay the blame any one political party, but particularly the SNP, for rising fuel poverty figures over the last few years. But we should recognise that the backdrop has been record investment in tackling fuel poverty from the SNP government since 2007. I want to address most of my remarks to the rural situation in Scotland, and I do welcome the task force's report that was published and addressed uh, that very important issue. I do think it's a pity that in, over many years, particularly in terms of the UK government dealing with the big such energy providers, that we've not given more attention to off-grid properties in this country because that is a real neglected problem. In many parts of rural Scotland, if you rely on deliveries of heating oil for heating your home or bottles of gas to, to cook with, you don't have the options that people on the mains have in terms of dual fuel discounts or all the special schemes and tariffs and offers that they can benefit from. You don't have that if you live in many parts of rural Scotland in particular. And that's why I want to argue for a lot more focus on off-grid properties in the times ahead, both from the Scottish Government, but especially from the regulator, Ofgem, and the UK Government in particular. And if you look at Calor Gas's briefing, they sent round members for this debate. Some of the comments they make is pretty staggering in terms of the UK Government schemes. They say they almost completely bypassed the countryside. And then it goes on to criticise the way in which energy policy and fuel poverty has been tackled in regards to off-grid properties in Scotland. So I think it's really important we address those issues going forward. In the case of my own constituency, 28% of properties are off-grid compared to a national average in Scotland of 18%. In Murray, we have the additional problems that contribute to fuel poverty and wider poverty. We've got a low-wage economy in terms of main, mainland Scotland constituencies. So family incomes are being hammered by high fuel costs on the one hand when salaries in Murray are already lower than other parts of the country. And the debt figure sent round by Step, the Step Change Debt Charity, I think, uh, explain that situation as well, with the number of clients with electricity arrears, uh, or indeed gas arrears, rising between 2015 and 2016. In the case of gas, 3.6% of clients saying that was a factor to 9.4% uh, of people who are clients of that charity uh, in Murray as well. So this is a real issue. It's affecting real people and causing debt in our society. The housing stock, of course, has been mentioned. Again, if I remember my facts correctly, 1% of our housing stock is renewed uh, every year. Therefore, this is again an issue that goes back generations in Scotland, the state uh, of our housing stock. In Murray, we have 8% of homes with a poor national home energy rating. 
which is way above the national average of 3%, and indeed 44% of properties have a rating of below 5.5, uh, uh, or 5 in the scale, which compares to 25% nationally. So again, the state of the housing stock in Murray is a particular problem. And that does bring challenges, as many members have said, in terms of energy efficiency measures, but we have to give a lot more uh, attention to these issues. I see that I'm running out of time. I just want to mention one issue that perhaps has not been raised so far, and that's the issue, as I call it, of energy justice. We are an energy-rich country in Scotland. If you look at Murray, for instance, we have umpteen wind farms. We have lots of development taking place just now with the transmission lines that SSE are putting in place towards the Black Hillock substation at Keith. And therefore, the people of Murray are watching all this energy bypassing their homes or indeed be produced near their homes and not necessarily feeling the benefit. It must be galling if you live near a renewable energy project or any energy source, but you're living in fuel poverty, but you're watching this energy being developed in your doorstep or being transported past your home. So surely we can find a way in Scotland of making sure that people benefit from having all this energy resource on their own doorstep. We do talk about community benefit from renewable energy resource projects. I would like to see some of that used for micro-energy plans or for tackling fuel poverty and introducing schemes in our rural areas where much of the energy is being produced. I think that's something where Scottish ministers could contribute. I'd like to see a Scottish national energy company owned by the public, taking a stake in many energy projects in Scotland and then using the money to reinvest in other energy projects to get people out of fuel poverty. So I think there are some practical things we could do Thank in this country you must to address Thank those, you. but we absolutely have to eradicate fuel poverty in Scotland. Thank you very much. Move to winding up speeches. Call on Mark Ruskell to wind up for the Green Party. Six minutes, please, Mr Ruskell. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Can I thank Labour for bringing forward this important uh, topic for debate? Very timely, I think, uh, this afternoon. Uh, I think it's been quite a mature debate, largely. I mean, I think the fact that we've got add-on amendments rather than delete amendments, I think, is important. And can I say now again that the Greens will be supporting all amendments uh, when it comes to decision time tonight. And I would urge all parties to, to do the same, because voting against one amendment will si simply weaken the approach of others. Now, the Labour motion scopes out well the nature of the problem and the multiple approaches that are required to tackle fuel poverty. And I agree with Alex Rowley. We do need to drill down into standards in the private sector. Um, we do, as Mark Griffin uh, has already uh, spoken about, need to revive the Warm Homes Act. We need to see a uh, transformation in the way that energy is generated and controlled. Um, in Denmark, for example, you know, a country which has a fuel poverty rate of only 4% compared to our 30%, you know, a lot of their district heating schemes are controlled by local councils. Um, now, we all agree on the need for a, a new target and for that to be produced quickly, um, Jackie Bailey, and a plan for fuel poverty eradication. But Labour's going to fail to ask for the resources to achieve this unless they vote for the Green Amendment tonight. Now, Labour set the fuel poverty target in 2001, and I respect that, but fuel poverty shot up under their watch and under every other government's watch since then. Rhetoric should be met with budgets and action. Labour have repeatedly called the SNP out for words but little action. Voting against our budget, asked today, will have the same effect. I can I turn to the SNP uh, amendment, uh, which identifies the ongoing consideration the government is bringing to the eradication strategy and the two very important reports that we've had uh, reporting to it and indeed the target and I acknowledge the seriousness with which the minister is approaching this and also appreciate his statement that he's not going to define uh, fuel poverty away I think that's important now a number of SNP members have talked about the collaborative approach including the minister um, that is required and I think that collaborative approach needs to be brought to the heart of government minister because I back energy action Scotland's call for a cross departmental group within government that can actually start looking at the savings that we can make through tackling fuel poverty including in the area of health which I think was passionately um, exemplified by John Scott's contribution uh, now, the Tory amendment um, sets out the important objective we share of getting our national housing stock up to uh, Category C by 2025. And Adam Tompkins is right to point out that a clear target can lead to transformative change. But it can only be achieved if we're prepared to make those clear budget decisions when they come to this chamber. So I would ask the Tories to back the principle tonight of increased budget. Because the Green Amendment simply states the reality that current budget allocations will not be enough 
to deliver Labour's approach and the Tories' stated objective. So I hope we can settle on the scale of ambition that is needed and support all amendments at decision time. Now, we've heard a number of contributions from members about the impact of fuel poverty, and I think Alex Rowley uh, mentioned a very moving example of a family in Fife spending about a quarter of their, their income on fuel, and we've had, heard um, examples from around the chamber. I'd like to turn to my own community, where there are large pockets of deprivation, where people live in old stone properties off the gas grid. Social tenants have benefited from internal insulation measures through the ECO programme over time, but that has left behind many low-income owner-occupiers and those tenants in the private, private sector who are struggling with fuel, fuel bills. And, you know, many of these families are on pre-payment meters, which, as Alex Cole Hamilton said, you know, have a voracious appetite. And many of these families are also heating their homes with open coal fires, open coal fires in the 21st century. And they're put off, these families I talked to, and they're put off by the complexity and the hassle factor created by a lot of the confusing array of schemes that we have. We also have the irony in our community that we have a distillery right in the heart, which is belting out waste heat 24-7. So it's clear that we need an absolute step change to how we tackle fuel poverty, one that responds to the circumstances of individual households, because falling into fuel poverty means you become more vulnerable to the causes of it. Poor mental and physical health, inability to find work, cramped living conditions affecting educational attainment. Family spiral of poverty continues from one generation to another unless we tackle this. So let me move um, briefly uh, to the practical action that we can take. More resource would enable a coordinated street-by-street -street retrofitting program through the SEAT program. Taking a street-by-street -street approach reduces the hassle, reduces the costs. For example, in areas of tenement buildings, the cost of setting up scaffolding would be incurred only once. And a street-by-street -street approach could also help areas of historic properties where double glazing that fits the planning rules uh, is high in cost. A new approach to building maintenance could deliver affordable warmth. This could include new legislation to facilitate common repairs, enhancing the role of home reports, and including mandatory energy efficiency measures in the sale of properties with a clear price tag attached. The Scotland Act's evolved new powers to Scottish ministers determine how funds from the UK government's energy company obligation are targeted. Currently, the largest energy suppliers must take action to promote insulation measures and connections to district heating schemes, particularly in areas of low income. But we can be much bolder in tackling rising fuel bills by pushing the limits of Scotland's newly devolved powers to create a Scottish fuel poverty scheme paid into by those who make the greatest profits from energy sales to support those most struggling to heat their homes. Thank Presiding you. you officer, must, no, no, you must stop now. I'm sorry. Presiding <coughs> officer, no, you must stop now. Thank you. Um, I call now Graham Simpson to close for the Conservative Party. Six minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. This has been a useful debate, and I also thank Labour for bringing it. Uh, can I particularly uh, thank Alec Rowley and Jackie Bailey for their uh, considered contributions? Fuel poverty affects a third of households in Scotland, and a higher proportion of households are in fuel poverty here in the UK than in the UK as a whole, 35% as opposed to 15%. There is an issue and it needs to be tackled. We're all agreed on that. But the SNP has dragged its feet. Those percentages could be much better than they are, or at least we could be further down the road in improving matters. As our amendment and Adam Tompkins have made plain, we need to set a clear target to achieve transformational change. I said the SNP has dragged its feet. They've had the power since 2009 when the Climate Change Act came into force to do something, for instance, in the private rented sector, highlighted by Alex Rowley. But instead of acting, they've done nothing short of promising a consultation. Meanwhile, things are powering ahead south of the border. Now, Kevin Stewart asked for ideas, so perhaps he should look at what's happening in England. As from the 1st of April 2018, there will be a requirement for any properties in the private rented sector to normally have a minimum energy performance rating. The reg regulations will come into force for new lets and renewals of tenancies will effect from then. 
and for all existing tenancies from the 1st of April 2020. That goes far further than anything we see here. It will be unlawful to rent a property which breaches the requirement for a minimum rating unless there's an, apl an applicable exemption. And there'll be a civil penalty of up to £4,000 for breaches. There are also separate regulations which were effective from April this year, under which a tenant can apply for consent to carry out energy efficiency improvements in private rented properties. There's some ideas for Mr. Stewart. Now, the Scottish Government should look at these measures when it's drawing up its own warm homes bill. Now, Kevin Stewart is keen on making interventions, and I'll certainly take one from him if he wants to tell us when we're going to see that bill. No? Um, Mr. Oh, Stewart has responded. <laughs> we we'll see that bill next year, and I'm quite sure that the Cabinet Secretary will uh, add to that when she comes to stir something up next year. And Mr. Fan Simpson. Fantastic. We've got a straight answer from Kevin Stewart. There's a first. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> as, Adam Tank, as Adam Tompkins said, capital investment will be required. It leads to jobs and skills. I've seen in my own constituency some of the great work being done in the field of energy efficiency on visits to Scottish Powers uh, Training Centre in Hamilton and South Lanarkshire College in East Kilbride. Uh, but I'd, be, I'd happily take up Claire Adamson's offer of a visit to Ravenscraig, if that's still on. Jolly good. Um, she looks pleased. She does. <laughs> we would like to see the energy efficiency budget line gradually reach 10% of the Scottish Government's capital budget allocations. This means capital infrastructure investment rising from this year's £80 million to £340 million by 2020 21. We also think uh, winter fuel payments and cold weather payments should be protected uh, when they're devolved to the Scottish Parliament. If we keep dragging our feet, then that leads to real problems for the people we're all here to serve. For example, cold homes can lead to respiratory and cardiovascular problems. Alison Harris and Annie Wells both mentioned this. Uh, every one degree drop in mean temperature below five degrees sees GP consultations for respiratory tract infections increased by almost 20%, and John Scott uh, referred to that. In the 21st century, it's inconceivable that the most vulnerable members of society are at the mercy of cold weather. We're duty-bound to stop delaying and take action now. Research by the existing Homes Alliance have found that there are one and a half million cold homes in Scotland. One and a half million. In, in 2050, more than 80% of the existing housing stock will still be a home to a family, showing that focusing on new housing alone will not solve Scotland's housing issues. Now, Alec Rowley mentioned tariffs. I'm glad he did. Um, it is the fact that there is only one company um, that does not, does not charge standing charges. Um, only one, and that, that should be tackled. You In must conclusion, begin to wind up, please. I am, yeah. I repeat the observation that fuel poverty is too widespread in Scotland for us to carry on as normal. Current strategies have failed. We've called for a transformational change, focusing on energy efficiency and performance. That does require significant capital spend, but half measures will not do not if the fuel poverty strategic working group's ambition is to be realised. Thank you very much. I call Angela Constance to close the Government. Cabinet Secretary, seven minutes, please. Thank you very much, President Officer. President Officer, this has been a good debate. At times it's been challenging, at times it has been feisty, but as Mark uh, Ruskell reflected, it has, of course, been uh, a mature uh, debate. And I do want to mention Mark Griffin, uh, who gave a particularly uh, well-informed speech. Yeah, yeah. I do have to confess that the significance of the Toblerone somewhat uh, passed me by. But on a far more serious note, uh, I do want to start by focusing on what it is that we actually agree on. 
So we all agree that we're in the business of eradicating fuel poverty because fuel poverty and the eradication of fuel poverty is absolutely crucial to making Scotland a fairer country. We all agree that it's scandalous that we have fuel poverty in a resource-rich country, as Richard Lockhead reflected. Everyone agrees that everyone should have a warm, dry home. And I think everyone agrees in the importance of collaboration across this chamber, but collaboration eh, amongst government at every level, with the social enterprise sector, with the third sector, with housing associations, with, with landlords, with the private rented sector, and of course, eh, with energy companies themselves. And we're all agreed, we all have an absolute commitment to a Warm Homes Bill. For the government, we want to introduce a Warm Homes Bill uh, in 2017-18, a year two of the, the parliamentary cycle. And that bill, at its heart, has to have statutory targets and statutory targets uh, to end fuel poverty. So I suppose to answer Jackie Bailey's question uh, very directly, we will indeed uh, reset uh, the target and in acknowledging honestly that the target won't be met this year, that is not the same as abandoning our ambition to eradicate fuel poverty. Because this bill, and this is where we'll have to learn uh, from the past, this bill will have to be underpinned uh, by the right strategy. And when we uh, publish our draft strategy, which will include draft proposals on time scales uh, and other targets and actions that need to be fleshed out, and discussed and debated and, and tested. We'll also need to give particular uh, consideration to the challenges for rural Scotland because we know uh, that fuel poverty uh, in some areas of Scotland is as high as 70%. So there is a lot of work to do. And the purpose of Mr Stewart outlining uh, honestly and transparently Apparently, that sequence of events about using the learning from the, the expert groups to inform a definition, to inform targets, to inform a strategy and to inform a bill is at its heart to ensure that at the end of the day we have the very best possible warm homes bill. And I give me to Ms Bailey. Ms Bailey, thank you very much. Well, the Cabinet Secretary will understand that the Minister was asked twice very clearly to suggest that he was resetting the fuel poverty target um, to end fuel poverty, not creating a new target that could simply be reducing it by half in the next 50 years, which would frankly be unacceptable. So for the record, I am very keen to hear the Cabinet Secretary say that you, your ambition is to end fuel poverty. You will be resetting the target to do exactly that. Cabinet Secretary. I think uh, for once, me and Miss Bailey are at one, as she is at, is at one with Mr Stewart. It is uncharacteristic for me to be uh, more brief than my colleagues and to be more succinct uh, than my colleagues, but I am trying very hard, Miss Bailey, just for you, just for absolute clarity. And I'm glad that Miss Bailey is saying just say yes. But I do believe that the scrutiny and the debate and the involvement of Parliament and all our stakeholders is absolutely important uh, as we go forward. And I suppose I do say this with respect. Um, if any of this was easy, uh, the job would have been done by previous governments and indeed uh, previous ministers. And I think as Annie Wells says, that not everything is actually in control uh, of this government or indeed uh, the UK government. And I want to touch upon uh, the cost of fuel because that indeed has hampered progress. That's not an excuse, it is a statement of fact. Because if fuel had risen in line with inflation between 2002 and 2014, fuel poverty uh, in 2014 would be 9.5% as opposed to 35%. But let me be clear, 9.5% would not be good enough either. It still would be too high. And I want to say to Alex Cole Hamilton, we won't be casting aside the advice. That's why we do want to consider fully uh, the 100 recommendations from the two working groups, including uh, a working group on the overall strategy and indeed work the working group findings that was very focused on tackling uh, rural fuel poverty. And the Fuel Poverty Strategic Working Group in the report said something that I think uh, all politicians should reflect upon. And it is a particularly hard reflection for government. But the working group said that high levels of fuel poverty exist 
despite commendable investment by the government. Now, I, for one minute, am not demurring from the importance of investment. And, of course, the government will be bringing forward its mm. draft budget in mid-December. Mm. But that tells me that it's not just about the level of resource, it is the actions that underpin that resource. It is about what we do uh, with that resource and that there is something you know, far more sophisticated than the allocation of money. Now, I don't want anyone to uh, misinterpret uh, my comments. I am not demuring from the importance of investment, either in terms of individuals, in terms of uh, eradicating fuel poverty, or indeed in terms uh, of our economy. But the big lesson from the two working group reports is that despite investing more than any other government, we have still not eradicated fuel poverty. So we do have to take a bit of time to learn the lessons from past strategies, uh, from past failings uh, across uh, governments and across administrations, because we will have to do something far more than just reset a target. It will be the action and the delivery plan that underpins uh, those uh, targets. And for me in particular, uh, who leads in the, the social justice uh, portfolio, it's also about how we reach the poorest in our society. And I know we've touched upon the, the definition of fuel poverty. And Matt Ruskell is absolutely right. No one can define away the problem. But I was struck by the fact that 42% of those who are fuel poor are also income poor. And the issue there for me is not that 58% of fuel poor are not also income poor. It's that the definition uh, of what is fuel poor is, according to the working groups, is impeding our progress uh, to target resources uh, more effectively. Cabinet so indeed, Secretary, you I must do close. want statutory targets. I want legislation that underpins action, that recognises the action we need to take or continue to take in the social rented sector, but also in particular the private rented sector uh, and indeed uh, for private uh, owners as well. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, I call on Polly McNeill to close for Labour. Ms McNeill till 5.59. 4.59, I'm sorry. She done my glasses <laughs> Thank you very on. much. <laughs> no, I'm sure we'd love to listen to you all that time, but it's 4.59 for the avoidance of... Thank you, presiding officer. Uh, can I begin by thanking all the, member and, all the members and the ministers for their valuable contributions to Labour's debate um, this afternoon. Living in Scotland means that everyone has to heat their home in the winter months and these days sometimes in the summer months too. But today 34% of Scottish households are in fuel poverty. We are nowhere near the targets set by the Act of Parliament in 2001. 845,000 households are still in fuel poverty. Harsh winters kill up to 30% of those winter deaths are caused by cold homes. So the Labour motion is a wake-up call and it's meant to be a wake-up call to the Scottish Government that they must take urgent action now to reset the statutory target. I welcome what Angela Constance has said this evening in the debate, but I think a lot of time might have been saved if there had been clear lines from Kevin Stewart in his opening speech that it was the government's priority at the sunset of these statutory targets which have not been met, that new ones would coincide with the falling of those targets. But yes, I confirm that Labour, as other parties have said, will collaborate with the government on achieving any new targets set, but only the Scottish government can act here. Energy Action Scotland say the target must be realistic, but it must be set. The Minister said in his opening speech that he recognised the scale of the challenge, and I want a firm commitment from the government that redefining fuel poverty does not dilute the challenge itself in any way. And I welcome, of course, what Andy Whiteman said about focusing on poor households. We need to see what these statutory targets are going to be, we need to see them soon. And those who rely on this parliament to see that we are taking this matter seriously need to see them as a matter of urgency too. And I have to express some concern that there isn't any attempt to explain why the government weren't prepared for this, knowing that the targets would actually fall 
this month. But you will get the full cooperation of the Labour benches on this until it is properly resolved and properly resolved. Extreme poverty accounts for almost extreme fuel poverty accounts for almost 10% of those figures. In rural areas, as we've heard from Rhoda Grant and Richard Lockhead and others, fuel poverty is staggeringly high at 50%. We know that there are special reasons for that. But it has to be said that almost after 10 years in charge, the Parliament has, has been willing to support the government on this. They need to recognise that they need to be more ambitious. They need to put the resources to this important policy and they must be more determined to meet any new targets. As Ruth Maguire and others have said, being able to heat your home adequately and to run basic appliances without having to consider how you're going to pay for it is a basic necessity. As Mark Griffin said, no family should have to choose between heating and eating, but many ever do. As Alec Rowley said in his opening speech, progress has been made and that must be recognised too. But with a new focus on the private rented sector that we believe needs more attention uh, and should be included in any new statutory targets. But the consequences of not meeting those targets are clearly stark. We've heard that 60% of single pensioners are few, fuel pure, poor. A staggering 29% of adults of working age are fuel poor. And those with children stands at almost 20%. So the commitment that we've had from the SNP government to spend £103 million to install measures of, of, of 14,000 homes will help just under 2% of those in fuel poverty. It is not enough, it is not ambitious enough, and we call on the government to be more ambitious than this. It has to be said that there are many factors why the targets were not reached. But it is wrong only to blame the UK government without taking some responsibility yourselves. But I do agree that it's not just about money. It is clearly about identifying a strategy where the targets are closely worked in to the work that needs to be done. But being poor comes at a cost, as we've heard. The poorest households are locked out of the best deals, as Adam Tompkins talked about. The best bank accounts, the best borrowing rates, the best energy target tariffs are all reserved for people who are at, in a position to shop around. Even if you don't have a clean credit file or access to the internet, you can expect to pay more for almost everything. Actual figures indicate that prepayment users pay more than anyone else not paying by direct debit by an average of £150 being worse off a year. I surely will. Angela Constance. I'm grateful. I just wondered if Ms McNeill would acknowledge the actions that are contained in the Fairer Scotland Action Plan that are specifically targeted at tackling the, the poverty premium, uh, including uh, this government uh, leading an energy summit with big energy uh, companies later on this year. Pauline McNeill. I'm happy to recognise that fact. But the public are being seriously shortchanged by energy companies. And I think some other speakers uh, spoke about this. And it has to be almost uh, uh, as well as a backdrop to this debate. Recent reports show that profit margins, far from the 4% claimed by the industry, I think Graham Simpson talked about, are actually up to 28% of profit margins. Energy companies, the big six, are a major power in Britain, dictating what we pay for our energy with little accountability. Tariffs are too complex, and this has led to a distrust in suppliers. I do, and I have supported price caps on energy prices, or at least wider price controls. But I wanted to introduce you, if you haven't heard, of a, of a man called Martin Cave from the Competition Marketing Authority. The only dissenting voice in the recent report by the Com Competition Marketing Authority, Watchdog. In 2014, there was an investigation into prices energy companies are charging. The interim report stated this was to the tune of £1.7 billion a year. 
This is mainly due to the fact that 70 per cent of customers are on standard variable tariffs, far more expensive than other tariffs. But the CMA wanted to temporarily cap those prices for those customers. But through heavy lobbying, they withdrew this in favour of a much weaker provision to create a list of customers on these rates so that competitor companies can target them. If you could come to I'm close, pleased please, to say that Ms. Martin Neal. Cave would not put his name to this final report. In conclusion, presiding officer, we look forward to the government announcing the refreshed statutory targets to reduce full poverty in Scotland. No one should have to choose between eating and heating. Thank you very much. That concludes the debate on supporting local communities. It is now time to move on to the next item of business. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 2516 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a business programme. I would ask any member who wishes to speak against this motion to press the request to speak button now. I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 2516. Formally moved. No member has asked to speak against the motion. Therefore, I will now put the question to the Chamber. The question is that motion number 2516 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed. The next item of business is consideration of six parliamentary bureau motions. I ask Joe Fitzpatrick to move on block. Motions 2412 to 2414 and 2513 to 2515 on approval of SSIs. Moved. The question on this motion will be put at decision time, to which we now come. There are five questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first question is that Amendment 2504.3 in the name of Angela Constance, which seeks to amend motion number 2504 in the name of Alex Rowley on supporting local communities be agreed. Are we all agreed? The Parliament is not agreed, therefore we will move to a vote. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 2504.3 in the name of Angela Constance is yes, 93, no, 29, and there were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. The next question is that amendment 2504.1 in the name of Adam Tompkins, which seeks to amend motion number 2504 in the name of Alex Rowley on supporting local communities be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is not agreed, therefore we will move to a vote. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 2504.1 in the name of Adam Tompkins is yes, 39, no, 84, and there were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. The next question is that amendment 2504.2 in the name of Andy Whiteman, which seeks to amend motion number 2504 in the name of Alex Rowley, 
on supporting local communities be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. The Parliament is not agreed, therefore we will move to a vote. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote in amendment number 2504.2 in the name of Andy Whiteman is yes, 10, no, 113, there were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. The next question is that motion 2504 in the name of Alex Rowley as amended on supporting local communities be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is not agreed, therefore we will move to a vote. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion number 2504 in the name of Alex Rowley is yes, 94, no, 29, and there were no abstentions. The motion as amended is therefore agreed. I propose to ask a single question on Parliamentary Bureau motions 2412 to 2414 and 2513 to 2515. If any member objects to a single question being put, Please say so now. No member has objected. Therefore, the question is that motions 2412 to 2414 and 2513 to 2515 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed. That concludes decision time. We will now move to members' business. Please those leaving the chamber do so quickly and quietly. <laughs>